The Stamina Warden has officially made a comeback and in a surprisingly passive way. With some really unique and awesome alterations to the class and its passives, the Warden, even in the Stam spec, has the ability to pump out some pretty solid damage. This guide will not only keep you up to date on all of the major changes coming with the Firesong DLC, but also give you all of the tools that you need to know in order to maximize your damage on the Warden. Be sure to check out the timestamps if there is any one section you'd prefer to learn over another, or if you simply need to rewatch some things, as we have many details regarding this class that we will be discussing. With that said, let's get right into it. The Firesong update has finally given endgame players a chance to breathe. The Warden sees the most changes of any class this patch, but overall, the amount of actual change is very little, and the small adjustments that do exist all work very well together. Most of the changes to the Warden revolve around passives. Advanced Species now increases crit damage by up to 4%. Rather than giving penetration, Glacial Presence now increases the damage done by your chilled status effect on a value determined by your highest offensive stat, rather than adding 10% crit damage to chilled targets. This basically changes a passive that was completely useless into a passive that adds about 5k DPS just for existing with this specific setup. Piercing Cold now increases raw damage output by up to 2% at base, which increases to up to 12% when using an Ice Staff, rather than increasing your Magic and Frost damage by up to 10%. Another huge buff to the class. Lastly, two major skills received some changes that make them worth using over other alternatives. The Warden gets a new class ability that we can utilize this patch as the cap and damage previously placed on Arctic Blast has now been removed, making this a very strong option. Finally, Elemental Susceptibility has received a few changes, the most important being that the morph now applies each elemental status effect, that is, burning, chilled, and concussed, once every 6 seconds for 4 seconds, rather than applying a random one once every 6 seconds. This ensures very high uptimes on all three of these status effects, making this a must-have skill when running a staff. Likewise, the duration now lasts only 30 seconds as opposed to 60, and the range has been increased by 2 meters. Finally, Bosse has received a small fix as well, where the damage that the set provides now applies to pets which will affect the bear on the Warden. And that is it. That is all of the major changes this patch. This is such a great change of pace, and I hope to see this section of my videos in the future remain not much longer than this. Getting into the basic build information for the patch, not much has changed here. Of our options this patch, the strongest for the stam spec on the den is Dark Elf. Not only is this the strongest damage dealing option, it also allows you to very easily be able to switch between a mag spec if necessary, as Dark Elf is also one of the strongest options for mag specs as well. As an alternative option, you could go for Khajiit, which won't be quite as strong as Dark Elf but does have its benefits. In either newer progression groups that might have a lack of strong buff up times, or in solo content, you could find Khajiit to be a little stronger than Dark Elf, as this class does give a bunch of crit damage, one of the most important stats in the game. Though, the Warden does get crit damage passively, which some classes do not, making this option a little bit more niche on the Warden than others. For Armandus this patch, we will be sticking with the Thief. This will be the strongest option in all 12-man content. A decent alternative to consider for solo and 4-man content, however, would be the Lover, for any situation where you might not be able to meet the pen cap. For our attributes, we are dumping all 64 points into Stamina. It shouldn't be necessary for the sake of sustain or survivability in 12-man content to allocate these anywhere else. So we'll take the highest damage gain that we can by making our mag pool as high as possible. For our consumables, we have plenty of situational options to consider. In general, we will opt to use Lava Foot, which offers a fair amount of mag stam and a lot of stamina recovery. Resources do get a little sketchy, but with a well-performed roto, you should be about perfect without having to run the netch. That said, if you find that you are able to sustain it, mag stam food will provide the most overall damage. Again, this will only hold true, however, if you are able to sustain it, as stamming out will result in a pretty hefty damage loss. Likewise, in content, if you find that you need a little more survivability, you can opt to run by stat food, which offers max stam and health. If you end up deciding that buy stat is a necessity for a fight, you can help your sustain by using the Netch or by adding a mag flex skill, a concept that will be discussed in more detail in the flex skills section of the video. Finally, as an interesting alternative, if you find for whatever reason that you are struggling to sustain mag, you can opt for Jester's Coin, which offers mag stam and mag recovery. For our potions this patch, we will be opting to run the Alliance Battle Draught or Essence of Weapon Power potions, as stamina is our absolute primary resource. These will give us the most overall damage increase in content. You can craft Essence of 
weapon power by combining Dragonthorn, Bless Thistle, and Wormwood. As a potential alternative, you could consider using Heroism Pots. On a Warden, this won't be super common though, as it would require us to double bar Inner Light, forcing us to replace important front bar skills with a buff not quite as strong, and for us to drop one of our stronger back bar dots as well. These potions are also very expensive, as they require Dragon's Room, Dragon's Blood, and Columbine to craft. The only place where I could see these being meta might be in Bursty Fights, where we might opt to run the Destro ult over our bear, but again, these situations are far and few between. For our champion points this patch, we will be opting to run Deadly Aim, Master at Arms, Wrathful Strikes, and Exploiter. This is pretty different from what we've seen in recent patches, so allow me to explain Wrathful and Exploiter. Wrathful Strikes has always been the next best CP alternative whenever you have sufficient crit buffs in group to run over Backstabber or Fighting Finesse. Since the dummy now gives EC buffs, we can opt to drop our crit damage CP altogether. That said, skills like Bird, Beetles, our Light Attacks, and other non-dot type abilities account for a large portion of our overall damage. In general, if a CP node cannot buff at least 48% of your damage, you should run Exploiter instead, assuming solid uptimes. This rule has always existed, it's just more relevant this patch, as we would historically use Thaumaturge, but nearly every dot in AoE in the game has gotten pretty significantly nerfed since Lost Deaths, making it less worth using. That said, you can only run Exploiter in Raid if your support are maintaining solid uptimes with off-balance, as subpar uptimes will make running Biting Aura more worth it. So that said, as some situational CP alternatives to keep in mind, if crit damage buffs are not sufficient, whether it be a lack of medium armor on your end or a lack of buff uptimes on the support's end, you should opt to run Fighting Finesse or Backstabber. If you cannot consistently flank your target for the entire fight, Fighting Finesse will be stronger. If your support isn't keeping up off-balance sufficiently, you can run Biting Aura instead. This will be the next strongest primary damage CP. Force of Nature is a really solid CP alternative to keep in mind for AoE type fights as it will ensure that the most important debuff in the game, penetration, is kept up sufficiently on multiple targets. Finally, Exploiter is also really strong in trash pulls when a crow is running Scythe, as Scythe provides guaranteed off balance, and in a short fight that lasts around 10 seconds like a trash pull should, you'll have this damage bonus for 80 to 100% of the short pull. Getting into the different gear setups that you can run on the ward in this patch, I'd like to start off by discussing the different traits and enchants that will run across all setups. To start, we will opt to run six of our pieces as the medium weight and one as the lightweight. For our body pieces, we'll run them all as the divine's trait with max stamina enchants. On the jewelry, we're running them all as the bloodthirsty trait with weapon damage enchants. Note that in a raid setting, you can swap between weapon and spell damage enchants depending on your comp. You do have to be aware of the special classes providing special buffs, as the ultimate goal is simply to stack as much of one individual stat as possible. For example, DKs give the minor weapon damage buff and plars give the minor spell damage buff. Likewise, sorks give the minor spell crit buff and blades give the minor weapon crit buff. If you have all of these classes in your comp, you can switch between spell and weapon damage enchants freely. Otherwise, since we're running alliance weapon pots, we'll need to stack weapon damage and weapon crit, meaning that we want a DK and blade in the comp. If you don't have a DK but do have a plar, you'll have to stack spell damage enchants and run degen as a flex skill. On the front bar, we'll be opting for daggers, with the main hand being nernhoned and the offhand being charged. We'll run one flame and one poison enchant, it doesn't matter which goes where. On the back bar, we'll be running a great sword infused with a weapon damage enchant. Getting into the actual gear setups for the patch, as an absolute beginner setup, I'd recommend using Order's Wrath and Mother's Sorrow. Order's Wrath is an incredibly strong set that can be crafted in High Isle, offering a ton of spell crit and crit damage. Mother's Sorrow is a very strong overland set from Deshaun that offers a ton of spell crit. Both of these sets can also be purchased from guild traders. Because I've heard some complaints recently about Mother's Sorrow for a stam setup, I feel it worth clarifying that you can run Leviathan, which is a medium set that does the same thing, except it gives a line of stam instead of mag. While this will be a very small DPS increase, I feel that Mother's Sorrow is much easier to obtain, as Leviathan requires that you farm a dungeon, granted an easy one. It's a small damage loss, but a much easier farm in my opinion. For our meta setups this patch, we are looking at a pretty standard gear comp, which includes running Reliquin on the body, Pillar of Nern on the weapons and jewelry, the Maelstrom Greatsword on the back bar, and the Zon Monster Helm. This will be the strongest overall pure single target setup. That said, I feel it worthwhile to take a moment to discuss the variety of meta set options that we have, their strengths and weaknesses, so that we can then use that knowledge to better understand why this setup works. Appearing on your screen is a graphic made by the legendary Skinny Cheeks, outlining some of the best sets in the game ranked on a chart. In this explanation, even though Soulzon is an absolute S tier set, I'm gonna go ahead and label that as really a trash only set and replace it with Pillar of Nern. In terms of these three dot sets, the highest damage dealing set is Reliquin, doing around 8 to 10k DPS, and both Pillar and Whirl outputting around 7 to 9k DPS. Pillar has a slight edge on Whirl when comparing 100% uptimes on both sets, but Whirl is near identical nonetheless. Both Reliquin and Pillar will 
outperform the greatest in a pure single target fight, as Reliquin has no cleave component to it whatsoever, and Pillar's cleave radius is remarkably small, like within 2 meters or less. However, both of these sets act as dots only, meaning that they can be maintained in a fight where the boss is very mobile. World of Deaths, however, has a relatively large AoE radius, ticks for almost as much as Pillar, but has a ground-based AoE element to it, making the set weaker on fights where your target moves a lot. Likewise, Sororia puts out about as much damage as Pillar and World, but only is effective in relatively stationary fights, where you don't have to move very often. Sororia can work in mobile fights, but it does have a high mastery curve. With any of these sets, dropping Rally or Sororia stacks would make running Pillar and or World more beneficial than running Rally or Sororia. One final element to note is that Pillar is slightly more effective than Sororia on a Stam spec, and Sororia is slightly more effective than Pillar on a Mag spec, as Pillar offers a line of Stam, and Sororia offers a line of Mag. So for this class, I would rank the sets as follows. Rally, Pillar, Sororia, Whirl. That said, some fights fall out of the range of even Whirl, making Bossay and Riptide still relevant. In AoE fights that are mobile and or don't allow for tight stacking, Riptide will likely be the best option. The best example of this concept can be found in Rockgrove. Oxiltso is a fight that simply cannot be tightly stacked, and Bossay is a very mobile fight where the ad stacks can't always be pristine. Coral Riptide will likely be the go-to for these fights. With that, as some honorable mention, Zogvins is one set that was used pretty widely, especially in newer content that is only slightly less relevant this patch. Zog Zogvins allows the wearer to remove their source of minor force in favor of a different skill, making it most optimal now for fights that require the user to perform solo mechs outside of group, giving them the ability to potentially slot a heal. Situations that I could see this set being run might be VSS or VCR portals, for example. Another setup worth mentioning, especially for PC players, is the Elfbane Mechanical Acuity setup, as this provides the strongest overall burst damage for PvE over the course of a fight, roughly 30 seconds or less. An example of this fight might be the Snake in VRG or the Spider in VHoff. Finally, as a couple of alternatives to proc sets that I feel are worth mentioning, both Kinra and Advancing are still very strong sets that can be run as alternatives to any of the previously mentioned options. Kinra is best suited for shorter AoE fights, and Advancing is best suited for longer AoE fights, pairing either set with one of the trial options mentioned earlier. I don't believe these sets will really ever be meta, but they aren't that far off if you have nothing else to run. Or are trash sets this patch? Not much is changing. This information primarily pertains to PC, but I believe is important for console players to be aware of as well, in order to better be able to optimize for console rating. The most common trash setup includes running Souls on on the body and burning Spell Weave on the back bar. Both of these sets allow for incredibly strong and easy to control burst damage. You can even mechanically time out exactly when you get burning Spell Weave to proc if you are familiar with the average time your team clears each trash pool. The most optimal time to proc burning Spell Weave would simply be to attempt to allow the last second of the proc to tick as the trash pool is dying. This isn't necessary by any means, but just a little tip to maximize trash damage. Ozzer Blight is also very important to be aware of as it is the absolute strongest AoE set in the game for PvE. The only downside is that only one person should wear the set. Not only is Ozzer Blight strong for trash pulls, it is also very strong for well-stacked AoE boss fights like Bossay or Reef Guardian. You would run this set on the body in place of Souls on. For our Mythics this patch, the Kilt is by no means dead on this class, it's just not the most optimal Mythic to run if your group has all of the crit buffs active and if uptimes are consistent. If your group does not maintain solid uptimes or are missing any of the relevant crit damage buffs, you'll run the Kilt over your monster set. Otherwise, in fights where mobility isn't really important, you can opt to run the Sea Serpent's Coil instead, which will provide very comparable damage in most situations, assuming that you can maintain the proc conditions of the set reliably. If you cannot maintain the proc conditions, and if all crit damage buffs are present and consistent, you'll simply opt to drop the Mythic altogether. Monster sets this patch have actually become relevant again. Kialnar will provide the most overall single target damage, but again, only one person in group can run this set. The next best single target option would be Zahn. In terms of overall DPS, Zahn is very competitive with Kialnar, as Zahn offers one line of crit chance, making this helm near identical in overall DPS output to Kialnar and coincidentally, the helm used in the parse. There are some fights in the game where Zahn cannot be run though, so if the fight does not allow for good uptimes with the set, Stormfist will be the strongest overall option. Stormfist also works very well for tightly stacked AoE fights. Finally, Groththar can be used in an AoE situation where the adds cannot be stacked tightly as the next best AoE helm alternative to Stormfist. Finally, for our arena weapons this patch, especially for the Warden, the Maelstrom Greatsword will be the strongest single target option by an absolutely razor-thin margin when opting for an arena weapon. The Maelstrom Inferno, however, is negligibly less single target damage than the Maelstrom Greatsword, but is a must-have for AoE-type situations, as this option is one of the strongest sources of AoE damage in the game when paired with the already strong AoE skill Wall of Elements. This combo creates arguably the strongest source of AoE damage in the game. As one final weapon to look at, the Asylum Daggers are really strong in trash pulls when paired with Whirling Blades, though this weapon is more for PC as swapping it on console won't really be worth it.
Getting into our primary skills, these are the skills that we use on the dummy, acting as the highest potential DPS options for a pure single target fight in a perfect world with perfect uptimes. This is by no means the bar setup that we will use in every fight, but rather this will act as a baseline to help us make good decisions when optimizing our bar setups fight to fight based on the flex skill options we will discuss right after. Starting off with Silver Bolts, the skill will act as our primary spammable. You'll note that in this parse we are running the unmorphed version of the skill. The reason for this is that when we morph the skill we'll use Silver Shards, which is considered to be an AoE ability. Since we aren't running Biting Aura, we'll get a little more single target damage running the purely single target spammable in combination with the CP node Deadly Aim, which buffs more of our overall damage than Biting Aura would, and potentially opt to run Biting Aura in raid when we run Silver Shards. All in all, this is one of the the strongest spammables that we have access to on the stam spec of the den subterranean assault this is the absolute most important skill on our bar this skill was reworked and nerfed quite a bit last patch but it does still account for over 10 percent of our overall dps when applied correctly the skill casts two total ticks the first attacking three seconds after the initial cast and the second three seconds after the first tick this makes this skill one that you want to hit once every six skill casts, much like Power of the Light on the Templar or similar to Daedric Prey on the Sork. Ensuring that you don't recast this skill too early, as well as ensuring that you reapply it immediately upon expiration, is the key to doing damage on this class. Cutting Dive may look like a second spammable, but it's actually a skill that we are using for the dot it provides. Upon activation, if your enemy is not off balance, it applies a very strong bleed to the target that lasts for 10 seconds. In my experience, when parsing with the skill, the timing you usually works out very well for the majority of the fight, as off balance only lasts 7 or 8 seconds at a time at most. If the bleed doesn't apply when you cast the skill, just weave this in between reapplications of other dots. Barb Trap acts as our primary source of minor force. The skill itself does some relatively decent damage, providing really solid uptimes on hemorrhaging, increasing our overall DPS by more than you might think. Trap also acts to buff our front bar, and therefore our most important ability through the passive Slayer in the Fighter's Guild, which increases our weapon and spell damage by 3 percent per fighter's guild ability slotted an absolute must have deadly cloak this skill is a pretty strong damage over time effect especially near the end of the fight as this is when the dual wield passive slaughter kicks in which increases the damage of this ability by 20 percent against enemies under 25 percent health Having the skill active not only does a good bit of damage, but also gives you major evasion, reducing damage taken from area of effect attacks by 20%. Especially when you opt to run by stat food, this still makes the den feel very tanky. Wild Guardian is our ultimate of choice. This is one of the only ults in the game that you can passively have actively doing damage throughout an entire fight. This bear is our highest damage dealing ability, accounting for about 15k DPS between its three attacks over the course of a fight. This is an absolute must have in any single target situation on the ward. Winner's Revenge is one of the stronger dots on our bar. In a stam spec, none of the niche effects of Winner's Revenge really apply to this build, so this skill just simply ends up being another decent dot, slightly stronger than that of Degen or Scalding Rune for a frame of reference. It is worth noting that this ability has a higher chance to apply the chilled status effect, helping us maintain the damage that we get with this status effect, now relevant thanks to the changes to the Glacial Presence passive, which increases the damage of our chilled status effect by a value determined by our highest offensive stats. This also means that Winner's Revenge can help a bit with brittle uptimes in a raid setting. Stampede is one of the most important skills in this setup, especially when you consider the fact that this build utilizes the Maelstrom Greatsword. Since the Den is one of the few classes in the game that gets crit damage passively, the kilt becomes less relevant, allowing us to drop our mythic and opt for a weapon. All in all, Stampede plus the Maelstrom Greatsword provides about 7.5k DPS when combined, making one skill about as strong as Pillar of Nern. Carve is another relatively strong dot in our toolkit. Though the dot itself is pretty overrated, especially with the nerfs this patch, the main reason that we use this skill is for its duration. In a longer fight, having the ability to apply carve and let it tick for a full 32 seconds allows us to get in more spammables over the course of an entire fight, resulting in a noticeable damage increase over time. Arctic Blast received a pretty solid change this patch, again removing the damage cap the skill once had. This change gives the Warden another pretty strong class damage ability, one that is stronger than Scalding Rune, but not quite as strong as Wall for a frame of reference. This skill also does heal on initial cast, making it a skill that is versatile for solo mech situations, like VSS or VCR portals for example. The heal is not very strong, but it will likely be enough for advanced players in these situations. Fetcher Infection is one of the stronger dots in our toolkit, and one of the most reliable sources of minor vulnerability. If for whatever reason you don't have a Warden support in group, this will be a must-have for the sake of group damage. Otherwise, it's just a dot slightly stronger than that of all of our other mediocre dots. And with that, we have our bear double barred, simply so that it doesn't despawn when bar swapping, as having to resummon the bear every bar swap would obviously be a massive damage loss.
Getting into the flex skills for the den this patch, that is the skills that we should be aware of and consider running over some of our primary skills depending on certain raid situations. Starting in the animal companions tree with bull niche, this skill is a go-to when buy stat food is necessary in content for the sake of our sustain. We can barely sustain lava foot as is without this skill, so when we need more survivability, we'll have to use this skill to sustain our normal bar setup in buy stat food. Having this skill on our bar also buffs our bar's damage through the advanced species passive which offers 4% crit damage per animal companion ability slotted. This note could be helpful for maintaining crit cap consistently, assuming you were to drop a mythic in raid like we do on the dummy. Bird of Prey is a decent skill to slot for the sake of buffing your front bar and therefore burst damage. When activated, the skill offers major expedition, increasing movement speed by 30%, and while slotted, the skill offers minor berserk. That said, minor berserk is also sourced from combat prayer or camo hunter, which when discussing front bar buff options stacks up a little better. Camo hunter offers minor berserk, major prophecy, and savage as well as 3% weapon and spell damage due to the Slayer passive in the Fighter's Guild tree, making Bird of Prey really only a good skill if the speed bonus helps make a difference in a fight for whatever reason. In the green balance tree, starting with Enchanted Growth, this is one of the stronger and more instant burst heal options that we have access to on the Warden. While not our absolute strongest heal option, it does offer a very strong heal that we can get immediately, as well as offers minor intellect and endurance, which increases our mag and stam recovery by 15% for 20 seconds. Our strongest class heal, however, is Living Trellis. The only downside to the skill is that it does not provide an immediate heal. Instead, the first cast places a heal over time on you, and reactivating the skill before it runs out provides a massive burst heal. In situations where you shouldn't really need to react quickly to incoming damage, this will be your go-to option. In the Winner's Embrace Tree, Expansive Frost Cloak is a good skill to be aware of. If you don't have a Warden support in group for whatever reason, Frost Cloak is a must-have for damage mitigation, as this skill provides major resolve to your entire group, which includes increases spell and physical resistances by nearly 6,000 for 20 seconds. In the dual wield tree, Rapid Strikes is one of the strongest single target spammables that the Warden has access to. The skill is just as strong in terms of damage output as Silver Bolts, but it can be a little tricky to weave and does require some practice. The Slaughter passive does also apply to this skill, which can be helpful for fights where you need more execute damage. Whirling Blades is the strongest AoE burst spammable in the game, especially when combined with the Asylum Daggers, specifically for burst-oriented fights. Note, Silver Shards is our strongest AoE spammable for long fights like Reef Guardian or Bosse, but Whirling Blades will do best for AoE burst type fights like Trash Pulls or even potentially Lionar and Turacil. This does of course require the use of daggers, which we could find to be worth in trash situations. In the Destruction Staff Tree, Wall of Elements is a very good skill to run in AoE type fights that require cleave. In any fight that requires any kind of AoE damage, you'll likely run this skill paired with the Maelstrom Inferno, which increases the damage of Wall of Elements by a huge margin, making Wall the strongest AoE skill in the game. Elemental Rage, this skill is the next best ultimate that we can use on the Warden in the burstiest AoE ult in the game. If you ever opt to run an Inferno Staff, at least on the back bar in any AoE type fight, whether it be Trash or the aforementioned Bosse type fight, we should use this ultimate over the bear. In the Fighter's Guild tree, Silver Shards is one of the strongest AoE spammables that the Den has access to in AoE boss situations. While this skill does very well in longer AoE type fights and does do good burst damage, it just does not quite do as much AoE burst damage as Whirling Blades with the Asylum Daggers, referencing our trash setup. This skill is also very strong for single target and should be run in raid over Silver Bolts in 99% of situations. Again, the damage that we get from the unmorphed skill plus our CP setup is only very slightly more single target only damage. It's never a bad thing to have more cleave. Camo Hunter is a good skill for buffing front bar and therefore burst damage as it buffs your front bar abilities through the Slayer passive in the Fighter's Guild tree, as well as offers minor berserk when flanking a target, allowing a buff typically provided by a healer to be sourced a little more consistently on on your own. This is a great skill to run for fights like Vass, where healers cannot reliably maintain Minor Berserk, as you will typically be out of range of the healer's combat prayer. In the Mage's Guild tree, Degeneration or Structured Entropy is a solid flex skill to be aware of, about as strong as Scalding Rune and Caltrops. If you find that sustaining stamina is too difficult, you can always opt to use this skill in place of a Stam one. Degeneration provides the spell and weapon damage buffs that our spell and weapon power potions provide, making it a good skill to run if you opt to use Heroism Pots for whatever reason. 
Structured Entropy does just as much damage but offers a decent heal over time as well, making it very strong for solo type situations in 12-man content where you need to step away from heals. Shooting Star is our go-to AoE ultimate on the class when running a greatsword. In fights that require AoE burst, assuming that the stat can be relatively stationary and tight, this skill could produce more overall damage than our bear. I feel that this situation is pretty rare in content, mainly to be noted for console players in order to have some sort of AoE ultimate to use in trash situations that only requires swapping a single skill. In the Sigic Order Tree, Channeled Acceleration is an awesome skill to use as either a pre-buff to a boss fight or in pull-based trash pulls, as this skill grants minor force for 60 seconds, giving us the same buff as trap instantly in a fight, rather than having to run in and apply trap to receive our first couple seconds of minor force. This also allows us to drop all of our other skills first, and then drop and maintain trap, since we would already have minor force active for quite some time. In the Undaunted Tree, Mystic Orb is still very strong despite the nerfs it received, especially in Raid. The short duration makes it a little less preferable than some of our other dots in a solo situation, however, in Raid, having at least one source of the combustion synergy is important for overall group damage, as the synergy not only does a ton of damage, but also restores resources. In general, this may end up being a very slight personal DPS loss, but an overall group DPS gain for any fight type. Finally, getting into the Assault Tree, starting with Resolving Vigor, this skill is the strongest overall heal for the Stam spec on the Den. This will be our go-to option for healing in any solo type situation that we find ourselves in for 12-man content. An example of a fight where we might use this skill could be VSS or VCR portals. Anti-Cavalry Caltrops is a solid flex alternative to be aware of if you find that you're overly struggling for Magicka. In general, as a frame of reference, Caltrops, Degen, and Scalding Rune all do about the same amount of damage. Choosing any of these flex alternatives will usually be based on your sustain situation. It's worth noting though that Caltrops is by far the best of these options for AoE damage, and is one of the few flex options that provide phenomenal AoE damage in this toolkit. And finally, Proximity Detonation. This skill can be a very strong option to use as a pre-buff for trash pulls. The goal is to time the cast so that the skill goes off pretty much right before any single ad dies, even any of the little adds. This skill scales in damage based on adds hit, so maximizing its damage requires the skill to hit as many targets as possible. Getting into the rotation section of the video, the Stam Den has arguably one of the most challenging rotations of any class this patch. With one of our most important skills having an odd 6 second timer, in addition to the fact that we have to keep track of the off balance buff to maximize our damage with Cliff Racer, the Stam Den definitely requires some brain power. That said, the way the timers work with these skills, there is no real way to establish a truly static rotation with the meta skill setup. Instead, we will use a semi static rotation based on grouped skills to use as a practice this point as we work towards the more powerful dynamic rotation. So with that, getting into the static rotation, we have three main categories of skills. Our group A abilities consist of our 12 second timers, that is Winner's Revenge, and we will overcast Stampede a little early at 12 seconds as well. We do not include Cutting Dive into this category, simply because I feel that the skill didn't line up very well statically. Our group B abilities are going to be cast once every 20 seconds, those skills being Arctic Blast, Trap, Deadly Cloak, and Fetcher. Finally, our group C skills are the skills that we will cast dynamically when none of our group A or B skills need to be reapplied. We will cast these skills only during the spammable phases in the rotation. Those skills are Beetles, Silver Bolts, Cutting Dive, Carve, and our ultimate. Timer-wise, Cutting Dive and Carve are the only skills that you'll need to track, keeping an eye on that off-balance timer as well and holding back from casting Cutting Dive while it's active. We'll take a look at that shortly. With that, a few tips directly related to the static rotation. The general premise of the rotation is to limit the amount of timers that you have to look at. If a group A ability needs to be reapplied, then you will reapply all of your group A abilities together. The same holds true for group B. Of our group C skills, the most important in the priority is Subterranean Assault. You will always use this skill as a priority, attempting to cast it once every six skills. The only exception to this rule is if you have to reapply both Group A and B skills back to back. Cutting Dive is the next most important skill in Group C. This skill can get a little tricky to maintain, but you're looking for this symbol if you're on console and don't have access to add-ons that make this timer a little easier to track. You'll find that it starts at 6 seconds near the mid-left portion of the boss's debuffs and moves left as the timer decreases. This means that the boss is off balance and that applying Cutting Dive will not provide its bleed. When the timer says 0, you can cast Burn 
bird, and it'll take about a second for the bird to actually land, and the boss will no longer be off balance by the time it connects. Finally, there will likely be at least a couple of sections near the end of the parse that you are drained on stamina. If stamina is getting low, try to recognize and recast any mag skills that are going to expire soon. If this is not an option, try to plan out a good time to heavy attack, ideally when all timers are active, including shocks. I had to heavy attack one time in the 117k parse that I managed to get out of this rotation. Getting into the demonstration, we'll start with a pre-buff of Arctic Blast, Cloak, shocks and then we will run up to the dummy to throw trap i spent some time finding the optimal distance to run in from to make sure that the ticks of arctic blast and cloak didn't go off as i was running in to set trap so that i could set trap swap to the back bar and start the rotation with the opening which begins with our first light attack and goes fetcher stampede winner's revenge carve shocks ult cutting dive and now we start the actual rotation which again the premise of which is to reapply our grouped skills together when one of those timers runs out and to use our group c skills dynamically in a smart and efficient manner throughout the entire parse it's important to keep track of carve which is going to run out soon and will reapply here followed by our group a skills that is stampede and winner's revenge then followed by shocks one two three four five shocks one two three our group a skills as four and five shocks one two three carve five and that pattern with shocks continues on even as we're reapplying our group b skills here as we will perfectly be able to do so before shocks runs out followed by our group a skills and now we're keeping an eye on cutting dive you'll notice here that we choose not to throw cutting dive because we still have four seconds left on off balance this is the timer that we saw and we're discussing earlier when this timer reaches zero we'll go ahead and throw cutting dive as you see here it says four three two one and we'll throw cutting dive now right at zero and it will be reapplied as off balance expires just as the bird strikes the boss throughout the semi-static rotation that timer with bird is going to be offset quite a bit in my experience obviously it's not the end of the world as this parse was only 3k behind the full dynamic but again i strongly advise for the sake of overall damage especially in content to use this concept as a way to practice keeping track of timers and try to work your way up to the fully dynamic rotation to maximize your damage and content Getting into our dynamic rotation, the Warden's Roto has gotten pretty significantly more complicated with this setup, but is a very fun rotation to perform. In general, the rotation is crutched around casting your beetles once every six skills, and then weaving in skills as they expire between that cadence. The other niche element, as discussed in the static rotation, involves tracking the off-balance timer on the boss's debuff bar if you are on console. If you are on PC, you can simply download an add-on that makes the timer a bit more visible to you, but for my fellow console players, it's important to know that when you see this icon, icon you should avoid casting cutting dive as this indicates that the boss is off balance and you won't get the bleed from the skill in the event that multiple skills are about to expire at the same time you should refer to this priority and reapplication which simply lets you know which skills to prioritize usually based on damage output or based on the total damage buff provided by the skill this priority goes carve beetles stampede trap ultimate winner's revenge cutting dive arctic blast cloak and fetcher Getting into the demonstration, I'm first going to show you how to do the quote-unquote PC pre-buff as a console player. So you'll see here that I have channeled acceleration slotted where I'd normally have cutting dive and northern storm slotted over the bear. I chose to slot channeled acceleration because cutting dive is the very first skill that we see when we select our skills, so it'll make the swap a little bit quicker and easier. Here we're going to cast channeled acceleration followed immediately by northern storm and then hit the well. Once we've hit the well, we can go ahead and hit the start button as we've pre-selected our skills, meaning I already have the cursor over channel of acceleration. And then once we exit that screen, I had the cursor already over skills. So that as soon as we hit the start button, we can go straight into skills, hit up immediately after we hit skills and be on channel of acceleration and slot it straight to cutting dive. Then we go over to slots, slot wild guardian, and we are out of the window before we even finish the well. So as soon as we exit the well, we can summon our bear and then we will start the actual pre-buff which goes shocks arctic blast cloak and then we throw the first light attack which signals the opening of the parse that opening goes stampede carve winner's revenge fetcher shocks ultimate cutting dive trap and from here on out we reapply skills dynamically as they expire again with shocks being the absolute forefront of that priority so as you'll see we'll cast shocks one two three 
four, five. Shocks. One, two, three, four, five. Shocks. One, two, three, four, five. And I just have that internal count going on in my head throughout the entire parse. As we can see here, the boss is off balance, as discussed earlier, with about three seconds now left on that timer. We threw cutting dive just a hair late there with one second to expiration. That was in that situation, the correct decision, as it was the only dot that need reapplied at the time, but unfortunately, the boss was off balance just as the bird struck. And here you'll see another situation where we throw the bird, but unfortunately, the boss is off balance for another six seconds. We can keep track of the six second timer, and as soon as it hits zero, we'll throw cutting dive, as it counts down here from five, four, three, two, and we'll freeze frame right on zero here as cutting dive is selected and thrown. And you'll see that the timer disappears just as the bird strikes the boss. Before getting into the 120k parse, I'd like to discuss my tips for parsing on this class to help you maximize your damage on the dummy and in content. With that, the foundation, the most important part of this rotation, is to cast beetles as close to on cooldown as possible. With the static rotation, just try to make sure that you use it as much as possible, but with the dynamic rotation, cast this as an absolute priority. As soon as the skill expires, throw beetles right back down. Again, cutting dive adds a really interesting element to this rotation as it requires us to keep an eye on the off-balance debuff given to the boss. If you're on PC, there are plenty of add-ons to help keep track of this, but for console players, you can only see it under the boss's debuffs, with target debuffs from others turned on in your combat settings. Go back through the rotation sections if you missed the demonstration of this concept, so that you can see what the icon looks like if you don't already know. One concept that was not discussed in detail much outside of the dynamic demonstration is the PC pre-buff. You can do this pre-buff on console, and I've demonstrated how to in the parse, but keep in mind that it will only add maybe 1-2k to at the absolute most to your overall parse. This pre-buff involves casting Channel of Acceleration and Northern Storm before swapping back to the regular bar setup for a little bit of extra damage near the beginning. Before I knew about this, I was averaging around 116 to 117k, maxing at 119, and after discovering this pre-buff, I was averaging 117 to 118k, maxing at 120.5k as we will see in the parse. Sustain on the Stamden is absolutely awful. Unfortunately, even with 7 medium, I found that I had to heavy attack once during the parse. This was hit or miss in terms of whether or not heavy attacking was a necessity, as some parses I was able to make it through just barely without having to, and some I was not. As a couple of sustain tips, try to offset your potion and shard timer. Sustain is about having resources at the right time, not necessarily having as much as possible in a single given moment. The main thought behind this logic centers around our mag dots. In situations where you know your stamina is getting low, you want to try to last until your mag dots and or ultimate are about ready to be reapplied, casting your ult as a priority to anything else, and reapplying mag dots a second or two early if necessary. This will likely result in a stam dot dropping for a second or two, but then you will likely have a shard or potion ready by the time you make it through your mag dots. Stampede is an important skill, but one to avoid when you are completely out of stamina. Again, you shouldn't have to let it fall off for very long, especially if you are offsetting these timers. Finally, if you casted all of your mag dots and still haven't gotten a shard, try to make sure that as many dots as possible have been reapplied, including your beetles, and then throw a heavy attack. Keep track of your pillar of Nern proc, maximizing damage with the setup means keeping Pillar of Nern active for as long as possible. Remember, Pillar of Nern can be maintained at 100%. When the dot is at its last second, it can be reapplied. In other words, if the timer reaches one second, make sure you reapply a skill on the front bar so that the damage ticks as the proc reaches zero seconds, then it will be immediately reapplied. Keeping up Pillar of Nern is worth letting a back bar dot drop off for a second if necessary. In general, you should allow all of your skills to fully expire before recast. Only recast skills early if another priority timers such as your beetles, for example, is going to prevent you from reapplying a skill once it runs out. This concept also applies to skills that tick once every two seconds, as recasting early will cause you to lose a full tick of the skill's damage. The best thing that you can do is allow the skill to run out, and then immediately reapply it in order to achieve back-to-back -back ticks. Skills that operate this way include Deadly Cloak, Arctic Blast, and Trap. Though I consider Trap to be a small exception as we mainly use the skill as a buff for Minor Force, making it okay to reapply a little early if needed. Practice Weaving in general, practice your weaving separately from your parse and get a good idea how fast you can weave your abilities individually so that you can put together different combinations of skills to weave for the sake of practice. You also need to be aware of the skills that weave a little odd on this class, the main one being Stampede, which requires movement in order to get the GCD to behave normally. Slightly wiggling the thumbstick or just tapping the W key will suffice. 
I also found that Arctic Blast seemed to have a little bit of a delay with its animation based on when I felt like I should be casting a light attack. You may find that holding back on the light attack cast ever so slightly when bar swap canceling this skill especially will improve your weave average. And finally, practice efficiently. Simply doing full parse after full parse is setting yourself up for failure. Isolate the weak points in your rotation, whether it be managing certain timers or weaving, and practice these elements separately from a full parse. Using the full parse as a way to implement and check yourself on your practice. Thank you so much, everybody, for checking out the video. As always, if you found the video helpful, if you learned something new, do me a favor, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and let me know in the comments section below if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. I pride myself on responding to every single comment, so feel free to test me on that statement. Be sure to join the Discord in order to get the full version of the written guide. I've included a condensed version of it in the description below, but YouTube only gives me so many characters, so if you want the full version, you're going to have to join the Discord. Likewise, I'm on Twitch, Twitter, TikTok, and Patreon, so be sure to shoot me a follow on all of those platforms as well. It would be much appreciated. And a special shout out and thanks to the legendary Skinny Cheeks for providing the graphic used to help differentiate the variety of meta sets that we have access to with recent updates. And a special shout out and thanks to all of my current Patreons, Clyde, Reef, Flug, and Rico. Thank you so much for your support, my friends. It's because of you that this content is made possible. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much, my friends. And thanks to all of you as well for all of your love and support. I appreciate each and every one of you, and I will see you in the next one. Calling me, calling me, they'll be calling me royalty.